Okay, so um, we were talking about translation, and I wanted to review this whole process one last time. The final set of images that we have here in the public file. You need to remember, I'm actually. Uh, General Biology 2 has an exam immediately after this, so I'll try to remember to do it while we're taking our exam. Um, send you an email link to the YouTube account that has all of these videos posted. Uh, so today we're talking about recombinant DNA technologies. Um, we'll finish that discussion on Friday. Do we have a review session on Monday? Or do we, I think we go directly to the exam on Monday, is that right? Yeah. You have the amazing opportunity to demonstrate your mastery of this information. Is that right? Yeah. I think that's it. I'm as surprised as you are. But probably not as, uh, it is hard. Um, so the discussion the next two days is really a good setup for what we'll be doing in lab next week. For those of you who read lab on Monday, we learned about how we care. The first week we characterized cDNA sequences. On Monday we characterized genomic sequences and came to understand the splicing process a little better. Would you guys say that the, the two lab sessions have coordinated very tightly with what we've been doing here in the lecture portion of the course? Yeah. Yes. I hope you're being bombarded by this stuff and it all sticks. I hope you don't realize how much you've learned. You've just learned a tremendous amount. Hopefully we'll get to that. So these next two are basically setting up for the third and final dry lab, computer lab portion of the course. And in that, we will learn how to, on paper, figure out a strategy for cloning your gene, the protein coding sequence, into a plasmid. And that's your goal in lab. That's it. I've assigned you a gene. You're going to design the primers and you're going to figure out how to get that in plasma. Good luck. Okay. So, um, we'll review translation one more time and then get into um, gene cloning and recombinant DNA technologies in this next uh, two, four, two, uh, two classes here. So, to start with, what we've got is we've got our processed, so this is a mature mRNA. Then talk going through RNA processing. We have our 7 methyl binding cap. This is actually going to be the binding site for the small ribosomal subunit as part of the initiation phase of translation. Remember, we had an initiation for transcription, and that was basically binding, forming the open complex, and then the first nucleotides going on and getting past that stage of abortive uh, uh, transcripts. There's an elongation stage of translation or of transcription. And there will be an elongation stage of translation once we initiate. So once the small ribosomal subunit associates, it scans down to the initiation codon, at which point when it starts adding the, the uh, amino acids on, we transition into the elongation stage. The large subunit will come in, start adding the amino acids on, we hit the termination codon, and most textbooks and most people in an undergraduate will tell you that's it, the ribosome just associates and goes away. We learned last time how it actually appears to continue to scan down so that it can actually recycle because the two ends are physically connected to each other. So here's an illustration of the process. That didn't work, don't be good. So in addition to the ribosome, there are many other proteins that are associated with this, and I'm not asking you to learn any of the names of these. It's graduate level stuff. You learn specific details as you need. Wikipedia, believe it or not, Wikipedia is awesome as far as describing all this stuff. If you need to know it, you can go on Wikipedia. Here are some of these factors. Here are three factors which were purified and demonstrated to bind to the 7 methyl cap. This is called the cap binding complex. The shape of these is basically a puzzle piece that is a match for the puzzle piece shape of the ribosome that clicks right on there. This is what brings the small ribosomal subunit to the area. If you want to do an analogy, 
The promoter is a DNA sequence that brings RNA polymerase in for transcription. You could think of this as the promoter that brings the ribosome in for translation. Does that make sense? You look totally lost there. No, I was just contemplating this. Okay, okay. Set it in stone there. But if you want to repeat yourself, okay. <laughs> So we diagrammed and we said, there's basically there's an upstream region we call the promoter. And the function of the promoter is to bring RNA polymerase in so we can find plus one as it goes. You could actually think by analogy, promoter is to gene as cat binding complex is to I guess, co uh, protein coder, open reading frame. So we have the cat binding complex hangs on to the messenger RNA, brings the small ribosomal subunit in so that I can go down, right? So the anal what, what's the analogous factor? If this is the small ribosomal subunit, what's the analogous factor that gets recruited here? Sigma. Sigma for RNA polymerase. Good. Great, okay. I totally confused a lot of you, sorry about that. So, oops. So here the small ribosomal subunit comes in. The small ribosomal subunit has buried in here the initiation transfer RNA, the transfer RNA that has some binding on it. And it uses the anti-codon of that. It just, this thing basically slides down. If it hits an a AUG, it, it will try to hybridize that. And if that AUG is not in a proper COSAC, it just slides right on by. And they call that scanning. So the small ribosomal subunit will scan down until it finds an AUG in a proper COSAC consensus sequence. At which point, the three nucleotides that hybridize onto the RNA, the, the anticodon of the transfer RNA, as it's sliding past, as it hybridizes onto the codon of the initiation codon, that's enough to hold this in place. Then the large subunit of the ribosome comes in and binds. So proteins come, so proteins go. But ultimately, what we've got now is we have the P site and the A site of my large subunit here. And this is the protein site and this is the amino acid site. For translation to continue, another transfer RNA will come in. It'll go, am I, am I the right match for the next three nucleotides? Probably not. So it goes, and they keep coming and going until the correct transfer RNA comes in. And it will have attached to it the correct amino acid that codes, that is for the code. At which point this covalent bond is broken, and then this methionine will be transferred onto whatever this amino acid is. And the shape of this is no longer favorable to be bound here, and the shape of this is no longer favorable to be bound here, because you've now got two amino acids poking up up here. And this will click over such that the P site is now here and the A site is now here. We can now bring the next, the next transfer RNA in. Got it? People will say, most people would say, it gets to the termination codon, the ribosome goes floating away, and it's done. What happens is the large unit, the large subunit actually goes away. It looks like the small subunit continues to slide its way all the way down. The poly-A binding protein physically interacts with this. So this poly-A tail is actually bent around and is up here. So the small ribosomal subunit scans its way around and then it's actually ready to be recruited because this is remember, this is like the promoter for translation, right? So the small ribosomal subunit will grab an initiation codon, a transfer RNA with a methionine on it, and it will scan down and start the process again. So how many times does it do that until it stops? That's a great question. How many times will the ribosome sneak its way around and make the protein? Um, like, is it, does it stay on the same codons, or by the time it gets back to the promoter, does the codon, like, shift to one? No, nope. it's yeah. No, it just, it doesn't matter. So, once it's, once it gets here and starts scanning its way down, it's looking for COSAC consensus. Okay. Right? So, the question was, how many times can a ribosome, how many times can an RNA be translated? And this was actually done many, many years ago. And remember how I told you, you have your poly-A tail, we get these poly-A binding proteins bind down here, such that you get this big snot of these proteins, poly-A binding proteins like this, and 
the RNA, the poly A tail, kind of white throat. Where the heck is the end of the poly A tail? We don't know, right? It's kind of buried in this big mess of protein RNA. It looks like, and this is another reason to support that the small subunit scans its way down, it looks like it actually scans its way all the way down and kind of knocks these guys off as it passes by so that when it finally pops off the end for a very, very short period of time, a couple of these adenines are exposed. And the machines that are part of our immune system that degrade RNA, they have a very short window to eat off some of those adenines before the poly A binding protein binds back on and protects the tail. It makes this big, huge complex of stuff that protects the tail again. So every time a messenger RNA is translated, it loses and I remember someone I used to know what he uses like 1.3 nucleotides on average off of its end. So if it has 300 nucleotides of A on the end, it can be translated about 200, 250 times before that poly A tail is gone and poly A binding protein can't bind and protect anymore. Then the normal immune system stuff will come in and degrade it. I said, well, gosh, why would it do that? And it's actually good to have a normal turnover of RNA. You can get rid of RNAs over time as they get older. So once the poly A tail is completely degraded, um, does the small ribosome just float off and look for another? Yeah, when, when the whole poly A tail is degraded, this protein is no longer interacting with this one. And so it's no longer circular. Probably the, the small subunit kind of falls off and goes floating around. And then the, the immune system defends the, the RNAs that degrade RNA come in and they just rapidly will destroy that. Within a minute, it'll be gone. Cool. I have put a bunch of videos here. Um, I hope the links are still good, but you can go and learn about um, translation and just watch the process as it happens. There's some amazing videos on YouTube. And I know that's what all you guys are going to be doing on Friday night. You can call all your friends over and have a translation party. Right? Something like that. Okay. <coughs> Does anyone want me to walk through this right here? I have diagrammed this out and we have walked through this. There's a tremendous amount of information we just demonstrated just in this here. All of this information is contained in that there. In lab, you should by now have become familiar with what that looks like. If not, we'll solidify that. For those of you who have lab tomorrow, right? We'll solidify that for you guys. <coughs> Anyone want to ask questions on this? Awesome. If all of you can understand, you can, if all of you can look at this, I've probably done one third of my success so far this semester. Okay? Good news. Okay, recombinant DNA technologies. What is this? Does anyone know what this thing is here? Gel electrophoresis. Right, right, right. If any of you guys ever, is anyone, come on, you're from my students. You guys watch Discovery Channel, TLC. <laughs> so they had to look to the DNA evidence. You know, the, the narrator will be going over. And so there is this crime, and they had to look to the DNA evidence, right? And then they usually show someone who's like loading a gel or they're looking at their bands and they're like, oh, very interesting. You will actually be running gels like this. Uh, when we get into the wet lab a week, uh, two weeks from now. Okay. How many of you have heard my Briar Rabbit story? None of you have heard my Briar Rabbit story? In the 1970s, people started using, there were a few, very few individuals who were very deep in the most advanced type of DNA research out there. So they started using these words called recombinant DNA. And, it's, and when I say few, there were maybe as many as 50 people who had ever heard that combination, recombinant DNA. In the 1970s, they finally created the machines and tools they needed 
that allowed them to take a piece of DNA and cut some of that, and take a different piece of DNA and cut that, and take two different pieces and stitch them back together. So think Frankenstein is what people were thinking as when the general public got word of this. Oh, you're going to take the tail off a squirrel, you're going to take the head of a human, you're going to take the uh, legs of a cow, and you'll stitch all this stuff on one body and get this mutant recombinant thing that's you know, an atrocity to Earth, right? People were worried that if we took mouse DNA and bacteria DNA and stuck them together, suddenly that would become life, that would be some in-between kind of something, and it would be horrible. And other people thought it would be really cool, or I don't know what, right? Let's say we take sweet corn and we take cows and we get really good tasting beef. Merge their genomes together. You take a cow, you just kind of shuck it and you're ready to go. Cook it up for five minutes. All right, anyway. So this is this term recombinant DNA. That's what that means. DNA from one source, DNA from a different source, put them together. That's it. It's very simple. Okay? So the idea of, of recombinant DNA, recombinant DNA technologies, is this concept called gene cloning. Has anyone ever heard of Dolly the sheep? Dolly the sheep was the first cloned organism, to the best of our knowledge. Sorry, the per first intentionally cloned organism. There may have been clones that naturally occurred before that, but that's a different story. So what someone did to make Dolly the sheep is they I'm shortening the story, so I'm sort of lying to you when I tell you the short version of the story. They took an egg, and they took the nucleus out of a skin cell from a sheep. It's a sheep egg. They took that 2N nucleus and put, they took the 1N nucleus out of the egg, so it's now a 0N egg. They took the 2N nucleus out of a skin cell, put the 2N nucleus into the sheep egg, and the egg said, whoa! It looks like I've been fertilized. I didn't even notice. Time to start dividing and grow into a sheep. So as that, though that cell was dividing, that sheep, someone then took that clump of cells and put that into the uterus of a sheep. And it embedded itself into the uterus, like, you know, and implanted like a normal embryo would, and grew and was out was born Dolly the sheep, who was a cloned organism. Dolly. All of the DNA was genetically identical to the DNA from the skin cell that they took off the other sheep, right? Dolly was a clone of that organism. That is one way to use the word clone. To a recombinant DNA technologist, we use the word clone in a different way also, a second use of it. And that use is, if I have some piece of DNA here, I want to take a gene out of this organism here. I cut this DNA here. If I take this gene and cut it out of that genome and stick it here and, and glue those together to make this recombinant DNA. And I put this recombinant DNA into bacteria. The bacteria make many, many copies of this stuff so that I've got millions of copies of this. What I have done is I have cloned this gene. You understand the difference? I'm making many identical copies of that gene. I'm using the, basically I'm putting it into the bacteria and the bacteria are replicating. So that is called gene cloning. And if you talk to a molecular biologist or a cell biologist or a biochemist, and you say, oh yeah, we're just going to go out and we're going to clone the uh, BCL2 gene. What is BCL2? Does anyone know? Did you? I have one that's BCL2. You have BCL2? Yeah, it would be so too. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. So if you're so hopefully whoever has BCL2, you're gonna clone BCL2. And what I mean is you're going to do gene cloning. We don't say gene cloning, we don't say organism cloning, we just say cloning. So you need to, as you hear people talk about that, you've got to figure are you talk about an organism or are you talking about a piece of DNA? And figure out which use of the word cloning you're using. Does that make sense? Um, so, researchers usually use two terms to describe the DNA.
basically what we're going to do is we're going to have, and you, this is what you'll do, you will have something we're going to call a host DNA. And it's like the bulk of the DNA that you're going to use to make as a recombinant. And the correct word for this is the vector. What we're going to do with the vector is we're going to cut it, and then we're going to put a small piece of some other piece of DNA in here. And so this is going to be called the insert. Right. So the ultimate goal of this is we want to take this and put it into a bacterial cell. If I have a bacterial cell and it's got its genome like this, if I put this piece of DNA in here, I sort of, I'm pulling a dirty trick, like a virus, I'm acting kind of like a virus here. <coughs> I want the bacteria to say, oh, here's some DNA. Let's make copies of this. And we'll have a whole bunch of this. So in the DNA, in the vector, I need a signal that tells the bacteria, hey, bring in DNA polymerase and copy this. Can you guess the two words I'm going to use? The plasma needs a <laughs> consensus, sequence. consensus sequence. A specific sequence of DNA that has a particular three-dimensional shape. There is a protein that has the matching puzzle piece shape that clicks on it. The name of that protein is DNA polymerase. So this, there has to be a specific exact sequence of DNA on here. DNA polymerase will bind to it and then start copying this thing. Make an exact copy of it. And that's how we get many copies. So on here, we call that, we made a fancy word, we call it the origin of replication. And we shorten it, we go O R I. So that this is actually, if you put this vector into a bacterial cell, it, we call it self-replicating. The bacteria will go, oh, here's this DNA that needs to be copied. Off we go. People have actually mutated the consensus sequence, and they found ways, they found, so if, the, if we know the consensus sequence, they've mutated it, and found a consensus sequence which is even better, so that the bacteria, instead of making 20 copies, they make 200 copies of the plasmid. And they have a massive amount of the plasmid in each cell. They've optimized the consensus sequence, made it better than natural selection even did. Whoa, that's cool. All right. Oops, I went backwards. So, what we will be working with. There's different types of vectors. The vector we will be working with is called a plasmid. And I hope in bio one you learned a plasmid is a very small piece of DNA that is not part of the chromosome of the bacteria. Does anyone know why why do bacteria normally have out in the wild? Why do they have back, why do they have plasmids? To transfer them. To transfer them? To other bacteria. To other bacteria? Kind of uh, what I learned. Yeah, that's pretty good. Look what I learned, kind of thing. So bacteria says, look what I learned to its friends. I figured out how to do this thing. So if I have another bacteria cell, the bacteria actually is called conjugation. Oh. Hey, David, how are you doing? They actually make a cytoplasmic connection. If I injected a dye in here, that dye would diffuse into the cell. They're physically connected by an aqueous bridge here. Plasma membranes fuse, and what happens is actually what happens is this guy reaches out to the environment. That's valid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're all college adults and we can laugh about these stuff. Like this. How many of you were in my Bio Two lecture where I talked about male and reaper, female reproductive systems? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yes. We'll talk more about that another time. 
this guy actually will reach out and make contact and then send one of the plasmids over here. At which point then this gets broken. These guys go off their own way. And the DNA polymerase of this is, oh, origin and replication. Let's make many copies of this. And now this cell has a whole bunch of copies. Why the heck does this cell want to have these? Why the, why the heck? Hey, I'm going to inject this DNA into you. How's that? You want that? Um, is it a virus? Uh, do I trust you? I've never met you before. Is this a good idea for me? Why, why, would a virus, why would a bacteria say, be open to accepting DNA? What's the advantage of a plasmid? They can confer like antibiotic resistance. Yeah, they can confer antibiotic resistance. So fungi, so the antibiotics we use to treat ourselves, those are actually chemicals that, that, that uh, fungi have. So if there's like some food that falls on the ground, <coughs> bacteria and fungi are competing to get that resource. So fungi are play dirty and make chemicals which are poisons that kill the bacteria. So they don't share the food. They don't play nice. What we have done is we've kind of observed these battles and been like, wow, I put this bacteria and this fungus together and the fungus always wins. There must be a chemical that the fungus produces that kills bacteria. That would be good to like treat my gangrene leg. Give me some of that chemical and put that in my leg. Great, medicine, here we go. So, Bacteria have evolved a countermeasure against the fungi. And they have genes that say, oh yeah, you make that poison chemical? I have, a, I have a protein that binds to that poison chemical and destroys it. So I'm protected, so now I'm getting my fair share of food. Right? So those antibiotic resistance genes are found on plasmids of the natural world. The reason that our antibiotics are not working anymore is you get sick and you take an antibiotic and there's some organism in you that has that plasmid and it goes around to the other bacteria in your body and says, whoa, looks like I have a magic card. I know how to detoxify that poison. Here, everybody take this card. And it shares it. I think of these as like baseball cards that they trade around. And this one will say, I'm giving you immunity to ampicillin. And this one will go, oh, that's really nice of you. I happen to have a baseball card that gives immunity to erythrocyte. I don't even know how to spell that. We're going to say E. Some other, some other antibiotic. Right? And so that's the benefit of these guys. We're actually going to use an antibiotic resistance to our advantage in the laboratory. But I want to note that on here. We have a resistance gene. Ah, uh, la resistance. Right? And in most cases, the one we're going to be using is ampicillin. Another common one is neomycin, um, canamycin. There's all kinds of resistance genes that are out there. So that's what most plasmids have. And then, so that's what a, a plasmid out in the natural world has. And then we have this thing we call a polylinker. It's rainbow colored, that's kind of cool. I'll do it black. So this particular image calls it a polylinker. I call it a multi cloning site. How am I using the word cloning? Am I going to put a sheep in that piece of DNA? I'm talking about gene cloning. So there are companies that have gone out and they have taken this, taken one of these out of this bacteria, and they have mutated the sequence to so that it, this sequence here is not supposed to exist in the natural world. But they mutated the sequence and made it a very specific DNA sequence that will allow me to easily take pieces of DNA and stick it in somewhere into this site in here. And 
there are many different ways I can do it, so it's called the multi-gene cloning site. The spot where I have many options to put different pieces of DNA. It was all for my convenience. The company spent thousands, if not millions of dollars, so that I would have an easy time gene cloning. And we could call up the company and, oh, I don't know, PCD, the one we're going to be using is called PCDNA 3.1 positive. And when I bought that, I'll bet it cost 500 bucks. For the class? For the, for the plasma. They sent me a uh, small tube that had some liquid with the plasma in it. test tube and send the test tube off, you need to send it in a padded envelope and that costs you what, like a buck fifty or two dollars and twenty cents, I don't know what it would cost these days. People send, researchers send plasmids around back and forth and rather than spend two dollars and fifty cents on a padded envelope, why don't I just send like a forty five cent stamped envelope so they take a plasmid and they'll drip it on a piece of paper and they'll take a pen and circle around where they dripped it and then they just put that piece of paper in the envelope and they mail that to another researcher who wants the gene. They take it, they open it up and oh, here's the plasmid. They just put that in water and the DNA diffuses off the paper into the water. They take the paper out and now they've got their plasmid in an aqueous solution. That's pretty cool, huh? The DNA is very stable. DNA is very, very stable. Okay, so to talk about this polylinker, we need to talk about this enzyme that I hope you have all learned about in general bio one called a restriction enzyme. I don't want to explain how we got the name restriction enzyme. It's an, en it's an enzyme that cuts DNA. And it, if, I, if I have a piece of DNA, if I have some circle of DNA, a plasmid of DNA, and I take my enzyme, when I say the enzyme cuts DNA, you might say, oh, okay, well, bam, and bam, and just kind of randomly, hey, here's a piece of DNA, here's a piece of DNA, it doesn't do that. The protein actually is a puzzle piece, it has a very specific shape. And it can't bind anywhere on the DNA. It can only bind to DNA that has the exact matching puzzle piece shape that the protein can click into and lock on. So a restriction enzyme binds to a specific sequence of DNA and then cuts that sequence of DNA. Okay? So this is GAATTC, that's ECHOR1. The enzyme's name is ECHOR1. It's an enzyme that was originally found in E. coli. It's a restriction enzyme. It's the first one that was purified out of E. coli. There is a different restriction enzyme called ECHOR5. It was the fifth restriction enzyme that someone purified out of the E. coli bacteria. So here we have the sequence, GAATTC. That is the shape that those covalent bonds of those chemicals form the puzzle piece shape that this enzyme, FOR1, binds to and it cuts. And it turns out the way it cuts it is it cuts it between this G and this A here, and it cuts it between this G and this A here. So the sugar phosphate backbone here is cut, and the sugar phosphate backbone here is cut, so that they separate like this. And I have my G, AATTC, this is over on a different strand. And here I have a G, AATTC, over on this strand. What do you notice about this sequence, G, A, A, T, T, C? Palindrome. It's a palindrome. This sequence this way is the same as the sequence this way. G, A, A, T, T, C. How cool is that? I don't think it is. <laughs> so the way this cuts, there's actually, these nucleotides don't have matching nucleotides on the other side. And of course, because I pulled that away, the, those missing nucleotides are here, and then they have a match over here, because the lower source of these toxic nucleotides are here. So these, we call the sticky ends. So if I took, if I cut my plasmid 
pardon me, if I cut my plasmid like this, I'm going to draw the plasmid with two strands now. They illustrate like this. You see what I've done? These guys want to hybridize with these guys, and these guys want to hybridize with these guys, right? That's where it was cut out of. So this is bacterial, right? That's a bacterial plasmid. Let's go over to the mouse genome and <coughs> out of the mouse, take a mouse chromosome and put it with echo R1. So we have a mouse chromosome. It's my red. My pocket. Well, a mouse chromosome. <laughs> And I cut it with echo R1, I can cut it here, and I can cut it here, so that I wind up with a piece of DNA that is like this. And these, because echo R1 recognizes GAA, TTC, and only that, I know that these nucleotides are the perfect complement to match with that. But this sequence here is the same as that sequence. So if I put this in a tube with this, these guys will actually line up and hybridize like this. But the sugar phosphate backbone is not connected. So we need to add another enzyme that will reconnect the sugar phosphate backbones and repair the damage. That enzyme is called DNA ligase. DNA ligase, these become connected. And I've now got a recombinant DNA molecule. And if my gene of interest was located in here, I had just cloned my gene. Right. Any questions on this virtual demonstration of gene cloning? There is a company called New England Biolabs, NEB. And what they have done is they have gone out all over the world for decades and they've said, oh, here's a new species of, we're in the deep Amazon jungle and we find this new species of bacteria. Are there any, does this thing make any restriction enzymes? Cool, it does. Is the puzzle piece shape of that protein such that it binds to DNA sequences that no other restriction enzyme binds to? If so, that's useful. Because this, so echo R1 cuts GAATTC. What if I want to cut, so this is echo R1. G A A T T C. What if I want to cut a specific sequence and that is G G A T C C? It's different. Echo R1 won't recognize that. This is a different three dimensional shape than this. Wouldn't it be cool then if I need to cut this if someone had an enzyme that cut this sequence? And that sequence is, I'm going to guess. I've seen it before, so I think it's not. Is it not here? Oh, it's BAM H1, of course. Um, I don't know. It's some species that's it's probably like uh, Bacillus something or other. I don't know what it is. Well, I've seen that one. I just pulled that out of my butt here. And, uh, so somebody went out and found that species of bacteria and found that the restriction enzyme in that that's the sequence, which is different. That's useful. Now I can cut the DNA in a different spot. I can start to choose, ah, you know, I didn't really want to put it in the echo R1 site. I've got a BAM H1 site here, and I'd rather clone my gene into this spot in my plasma. Why does the spot matter? Um, what if the echo R1 site is right here? I've destroyed my origin replication. I'll never be able to get that to make more copies of it. Or if it's right here, I destroy the 
antibiotic resistance gene? Good question. You take, you purify your chromosomes, put them in, in a water solution in a tube, add your enzyme, come back in an hour and you're done. Sounds easy, right? It will take you all semester to do it. If, if, what's this? I can clone a gene in using modern technology, which we don't have here for a number of reasons. I can clone a gene in 48 hours. Um, I might be able to do it faster if I'm willing to go without sleep and I move very expediently and get kind of lucky. We are using 1970s cloning technology. <laughs> Not because, so I can afford this stuff. I have some of it in the freezer. You guys could have it next week. But the process of you going through the gene cloning teaches you fundamental genetics concepts that you need to learn. Okay? Later in the semester, we will talk about modern techniques for this stuff, and you'll be like, I just banged my head against the wall for half a semester, and you're now telling me about this stuff? But yeah, some of the stuff we can't afford. Um, remember how long it took to sequence the human genome? There's a machine out that can sequence the genome in four to eight hours. Four in an afternoon. Here's my DNA. What's the sequence of my genome? It's out there. It exists. OK, anyway, we're way off topic. <laughs> this is the catalog from New England, New England Biolabs. And since I buy all my enzymes from them, and they know, like, man, that's a really small lab, and he's buying all this stuff, we must be like his sole, pretty much his sole source. So they send me a catalog every year. They come out with a new catalog. They have 400 different restriction enzymes. To restate that, 400 times they've had someone go out and find a bacteria that produces a restriction enzyme, and it, the sequence it binds to and cuts is different from any other sequence they've ever found before. There is a tremendous amount of versatility as to which DNA sequence you want to cut. So what I do is I call up NAD, and they're all really nice, and I say, hey, I need a tube of PVU2. I'm like, okay. Um, did you want um, 50 units of PVU2, or would you like 200 units, or 1,000 units of PVU2? I'd like 50 units of PVU2. Great, that'll be $63. Would you like it tomorrow? Sure. Yeah, tomorrow's nice, thank you. Okay, we'll overnight it. You'll have it tomorrow. That's what we've come to in our phone. The there was a guy on my thesis committee, so this is Dr. Stinsky. His PhD thesis was cutting DNA with a restriction enzyme. <laughs> he cut DNA with a restriction enzyme and ran it on a gel. That was his PhD. It took him seven years. Because <laughs> he had to grow bacteria up, purify the enzyme out of the bacteria, Purify the DNA, it was a mess for him to do. Now, all these other people do it, they just send it to me. I'm like, oh yeah, in an hour I'm done, see so, yeah. Pretty cool. Um, okay. So, why would we want to clone DNA? <coughs> I'll give you two reasons why. First, as I've demonstrated, we can make many, many copies of the plasmid. And once we have many, many copies of the plasmid, we can actually start to manipulate the DNA, like in macroscopic terms. We mutate the DNA, we do different things with the DNA, which we'll get to later. When I say you grow up lots of bacteria, and you grow up lots of the, back of the plasmid, you can have a tube, and you can precipitate your DNA out of solution. And when it all dries out, you can actually, there is so much DNA, you can actually see it with your eye. There's that much of the chemical around. It's a lot. 
The other reason you want to do it is <coughs> let's clone the insulin gene for humans and put it in bacteria. And I put this plasmid into bacteria. And I have the plasmid grow up in, I start with one cell, and let's say I grow that into um, 100,000 gallons, or 100,000 liters, such that each milliliter has 10 million bacterial cells. Now, let's see, 100,000 liters times 10 million cells per liter, that's a lot of cells. I can have all of those bacterial cells transcribe the RNA off of here, and then translate the RNA off of here to make the insulin protein. And then harvest all the bacteria that are full of human insulin. I break them apart. I purify the human insulin out, throw the rest away. I run the human insulin through a filter to sterilize it, put it in tubes, and sell it and make a ton of money. And that's where insulin shots come from. It's produced in bacteria. Anyone here diabetic? So the process of putting a recombinant piece of DNA into bacteria is called transformation. You transform the bacteria into a form that has antibiotic resistance. The neat thing is, if I, if I, so I, let's say I made this plasmid, and I put this plasmid in a tube of bacteria, and I've got all these bacteria, and only one cell picks up the plasmid. If I have a trillion cells in my tube, how am I going to find the one cell that has the recombinant plasmid in it? What's that? Got to kill the rest with uh, ampicillin, right? This is the only guy that has the baseball trading card for ampicillin, so it's resistant to that. So if I take this and I basically what I do is I have a bacterial plate and I spread all these guys out on here. All the cells that don't have a plasmid, if I have ampicillin poison in here, all the cells that have no plasmid are dead. They're going to die. Poison's going to kill them. But this bacterial cell has plasmid with my amp resistance gene in it. That cell can detoxify the poison and grow and live on the media totally fine. Well, what if the cells trade? It's okay. You want to trade this plasmid? Great, it's got my insulin gene in it. I'm fine. Any, if anyone else here wants it, go for it. I'm fine getting more of you guys having it. My goal is to have all of you with insulin gene in it. Okay? So that's called, this is called a selectable marker. And this would be called an amp plate. And I'm selecting to get only those that have plasma. Okay, so that's where I'm gonna to stop today. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Do only bacteria have restriction enzymes in them? Do only bacteria have restriction enzymes in them? No. Um, I think, to the best of my knowledge, all life does. So how come the restriction enzymes are looking for bacteria? Uh, originally they were looking for bacteria, but when they started, the question is, why were they looking only for bacteria that had restriction enzymes? Because at the time they didn't know that archaea were a totally different domain of life. So they have purified some from archaea, and I think some are from eukaryotes and it's I use the word bacteria. Okay. I should use word. Thanks. Other questions? Oh, which is the worksheet today? Um, I'll have to email our worksheet. Sorry. Um, so we'll be doing Friday. Yep, should be due on Friday. If you have a problem with that, um, let me know and we'll work out another time. Okay. All right, other than that, I will. Uh,